Welcome back to Coast View. I'm thrilled now to have my friend, Dr. Moby Solange. He's the president and executive director for the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies, and he also has Ocean Adventures, which is one of the top tourist destinations here in coastal Mississippi. Uh, you go you go do a search on it, you'll find out people love that place, and they come back over and over again. So a lot of success there. Hey, we visited with Moby. First of all, let me just say good morning, Moby. How you doing, my friend? Good morning, Ricky. It's good. Hey, we, we visited with Moby a couple of weeks ago about the latest at the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies and at o Ocean Adventure, and we uh, kind of covered the waterfront. Uh, you can go back and uh, look look up uh, Dr. Moby Solange slash Coast View on Facebook or YouTube or your favorite podcast, and you can listen to that. But we did not have enough time to get into this very interesting whale story. Uh, as you probably well know by now that a few weeks ago, a whale – a, a, literally a well <laughs> washed up on the beach in Past Christian. And the story of this well is an important story about the role that the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies play. Uh, we've often talked about sort of uh, dolphins being the canary in the land, in the, in the mind uh, that helps, un helps us understand about the health of the ecology. And, uh, you know, the, the whales are no exception to that. In fact, if you go far off the coast of, Miss, of Mississippi, out into the Gulf of Mexico, there are some healthy whale populations out there. So when one washes up in Past Christian, it's uh, something that's notable. It's not necessarily unexpected, but it is an exception to the typical rule you know, for, for coast of Mississippi. So it's an important moment. So we're going to tell the story of the well today. So, Moby, can, when did you first learn that there was uh, a dead well? Well, uh, we got a call on Saturday. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact date, but it's like January sometimes, and that uh, uh, there was something big floating. And uh, we sent our person in that morning. She determined it was... Uh, a whale, and we didn't know the species at that time, and it appeared to be one of the very rare species. That's how we started. And by noon, uh, we had mobilized, uh, uh, you know, the uh, city of Pass Christian, the mayor was involved, the county supervisors, the Sand Beach folks. So Saturday is a very difficult day to mobilize anything. And so uh, uh, we were able to bring in some uh, really heavy duty uh, uh, equipment. Now keep in mind, this animal was about 35 feet long and 12,000 pounds and just a baby. Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's incredible. So uh, what, what kind of species was it, Moby? Well, it turned out to be um, a fin whale. It's the second largest in the world. Um, they're prevalent in other parts, but not very prevalent in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, of course, there are many other species that have been there, and um, the Institute over the years has responded to uh, the pygmy killer whales, the melon-headed whales, uh, uh, and other uh, marine mammals. But these are deep water animals, and very rarely do you see them on the shoreline. And as we discussed, we'll probably give you what we think, why it arrived on the, on the coast. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it. Um, I, I remember early in my life when we, when I spent a lot of time in Florida, and Dustin Charterboat captains used to talk about in August, early September, they would go far enough offshore, and they would literally look for the whales. And when they found the whales, they would usually find some pelagic species and lots of fish and so on. Later in my career, it's, you know, actually, now that I think about it, I, I had learned early in my career about about pods of killer whales in the Gulf of Mexico, but it was after the oil spill that we started having more of a conversation about killer whale presence. You know, when people think about killer whales, they tend to think about Washington State, you know, you know, in the you know Puget Sound and that kind of stuff. But, but we've got actually a pretty healthy population of killer whales in the Gulf of Mexico, don't we? We we do. And again, this particular whale is a baleen whale. This is a toothless whale. Uh, these uh, animals live on uh, plankton, whereas the killer whales swallow things whole. I mean, they can swallow a whole seal or a sea lion, and, um, you know, it's, uh, within 45 minutes it uh, uh, becomes emaciated and liquid in the stomach of these tooth whales. But the baleen whales, you know, they gulp large volumes of water, then squeeze it out, and the baleen, which is like a big mustache in front of it, uh, filters out the plankton as the water is pushed out and then preens it to be able to then feed on it over 
many, many hours. So uh, uh, that's a big difference. And again, uh, like the fin whale can be as uh, long as 90 to 100 feet. Uh, they can live very long lives. And they're, they're also, you know, uh, a pretty good indicator of what's going on uh, in the deep parts of the oceans that have not been really looked at very carefully. That is why when a specimen like that arrives, it becomes uh, uh, an object of study. And, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, several different organizations and experts that came in to do a necropsy, which is in human terms, an autopsy on this particular animal because the carcass was fairly fresh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, what I want to do, let's you know, one more thing about this particular species of whale. And before we get into sort of gathering the whale up, bringing it to do this, this uh, scientific analysis of it, I want to talk about the capacity that you have and what you've built there, because that's important to this overall conversation about the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies. But before we do that, so this particular species is somewhat rare in the Gulf of Mexico. And we had to think about the Gulf of Mexico as sort of almost like semi-enclosed in a way because it's, it's completely surrounded by land. We know that. And that through, you know, through the straits, as you know, Key West, mm -hmm. you, you can, you know, you can get in and out of here. But uh, one of the important stories about the ecological health of the Gulf of Mexico and why we have to pay attention to it, why the Mississippi River is so critical to this conversation, is the fact that it's sort of the semi-enclosed body of water. There, there are few ways to get in and out. So this particular species would have had to have come in from the Atlantic, essentially? Is that what, or was there some resident um, population of them in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, I think this become a resident because once they get in, it's hard to get out. <laughs> And so, uh, and we have uh, uh, almost uh, 30 different uh, species out there of, uh, uh, of whales that inhabit the Gulf. And so it has become over time, over millions of years, uh, becoming a, an area where these animals are, have become residents and have become part of the ecosystem. And it is important, our capacity uh, for the last 40 years, what we have looked at marine mammals uh, as the top predator as an indicator species. And uh, these animals are just like black boxes. They store this information. And being the top predator, it tells you as, you know, when you look at their blubber, they would have stored the different type of toxins that might have, they might have been encountered. And so uh, a lot of the stuff that is uh, uh, unknown for throughout their lifetime can be recovered from studying them. For example, with dolphins, if you take, took a tooth and sectioned it, just like a tree, those rings in the, in the tooth will tell you what happened during the life stage of those animals. So th there's an incredible amount of information uh, that, that, can be, uh, that can be gathered. In addition to dead animals, what we do with live animals, and this is very unique with, the, with IMS. Yeah. We are following these animals through their fins, which is basically a fingerprint. And so we can study their movement migration patterns. And we can come to it, the two pygmy killer whales that we rescued, which are, which are also very deep water animals. For the first time in the history of the world, we were able to uh, rehabilitate them, kept them for 10 months, put satellite tags, followed them to see where they go, how deep they dive, what time do they feed, and we were able to determine, I mean, this is very unique to the stuff that we have done. Uh, we have been able to rescue melon-headed uh, whales, which nobody else has been able to do. So uh, the Institute has done some very remarkable work, and it's, uh, I think, uh, advancing again with its uh, work with the College of Veterinary Medicine at Mississippi State and working with other universities. Uh, we have made uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, advancement so that our state can use these as uh, indicators to be able to, uh, you know, ascertain what may be going on. It's extraordinarily important work. So if uh, if the average, you know, uh, tourist or even coastal Mississippian goes to Ocean Adventure, uh, you're going to see, you're going to have this opportunity to have interactions with, with animals, et cetera, et cetera. But behind the scenes of all of that, the, the sort of the, the foundation that created the the ocean adventure opportunity was the the uh, Institute for Marine Mammal Studies and 
what what Moby and his team have built there have been incre- has very very first it's incredibly important, but it's also impressive. <laughs> uh, for example, to go to your pathology sec- section to see what you built there. To be able to do the kind of dissections, essentially, of an animal like the one you found in Pastor Jan, it's really, really impressive. When we come back on the other side, we'll talk. I'll let Moby talk a bit about the capacity that he's built, and then we'll specifically learn uh, what we've learned about this particular whale. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to Koshu. I have my friend, Dr. Moby Solange, the president and executive director of the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies. And look, I have to tell you, early Moby knows this, but early in my life, I just I just loved anything to do with the water. Fishing, you name it. I had friends actually who worked at, at Marine Life back in the day. And uh, and just enjoyed my association with them. I, I, I at one point in my life I saw myself sort of being maybe a marine biologist and doing work at something like Marine Life. But it, it, it's kind of part of my DNA, so to speak. Hey, when we go when we went to break, we we're talking about this incredible capacity that you built there, which is the foundation for. Uh, the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies, that's incredibly important. Like you pointed out a few minutes ago, you're doing work that is globally important. So you have this you have this well that's washed up on the beach in Pastor Christian. You rally all these people, including the Sand Beach Authority and all these people to help you with this 12,000-pound animal. Where does it go? How do you get it there? And then what happens when you get it there? Well, it was about 300 yards uh, from the beach, and it's a very shallow area. This animal probably lost its mother uh, or lost, was sick and lost uh, from its uh, uh, group. And uh, slowly and steadily with the currents uh, drifted. It was a young animal, uh, probably uh, three, four years old. And uh, came in, uh, usually when an animal gets sick, they want to go to shallow water so they don't drown and, and be away from predators. Uh, so it was in fairly fresh uh, condition. Uh, Noah, we worked with Noah. They helped us with a team of uh, researchers. There were 30 different people that came in from uh, Florida, from Alabama, from Mississippi, which included uh, pathologists from the College of Veterinary Medicine, our stranding team. And so we performed a, a, a necropsy on the beach on Sunday. Uh, we were able to gather uh, all the uh, vital organs and tissues um, and then, of course, the Sand, Sand Beach Authority, with their heavy equipment, we were able to use uh, very long lines to pull the animal in. Again, it was an incredible uh, effort. Uh, it brought together quite a large number of experts who were interested in uh, using this animal to see what may be going on in the Gulf. The Gulf has been subjected to a lot of things, the BP oil spill, the uh, the, the, the the dead zones, the Mississippi River discharge. And so it has uh, historically been used as a dump. And so uh, these animals are extremely important. And I think we are still waiting on the results of pathology and toxicology and other stuff. So it's interesting. Yeah. So just to be clear, it's not like your your goal is to gather the entire animal up and bring him back to your lab. I mean, that's probably possible, but but not a likely outcome. So you actually perform uh, the process of getting the specimens that you need from that animal literally right there on the beach. So you've got, I can only imagine, you know, I've seen some pictures, but, and we'll post some pictures with this, with the, uh, with this video, but you, you know, the, the amount of people that were engaged around this uh, tremendous coordination happening, wasn't there? It really was. I, I think it went really well. And I have to tell you the uh, city of past Christian, the mayor, their fire department, uh, their police, uh, all of them really, really helped, including uh, uh, the supervisors, Dr. Ladner. Uh, they were, and of course, uh, you know, the animal uh, had to be disposed of. It was sent to a land uh, landfill. Um, lots of little things had to be taken place within a few hours, and I think it all went well. Uh, like I pointed out, IOMS has a uh, uh, everything that you can think of related to whether it's education, whether it's conservation, whether it's rehabilitation, research, all under one roof. Uh, and uh, Ocean Adventures, again, it's uh, making learning fun, creating good stewardship, letting people know that uh, the Mississippi Sound is a very important ecosystem and habitat. That That is why we are here. The largest dolphin population in the United States is here. Uh, 
All the baby dolphins are born here in Mississippi waters. It's a critical habitat for the most endangered sea turtle in the world, the Camps Ridley. And this is because it's an estuarine environment that has been there for millions of years and uh, we can destroy it overnight if we are not careful. And these animals, like you mentioned early on, are the canaries in the mine. What they're telling us, guys, when we are gone, you are next. That's what the canary used to be the indicator. When that canary fell apart or died, uh, the person would blow a whistle and tell everybody to run out of the mine because if they stayed there, they would be gone. So uh, I think... Uh, the canary in the aquatic environment is whistling. Yeah, well, <laughs> and we and we better pay attention, especially the Mississippi Sound. And we don't. We talked the last time about diversion projects and all of that. These are really, really important conversations, and we'll actually come back together again in, in the relative near future and talk about the latest on some of these diversion projects and how um, we better get all parties at the table. And we're going to have some real, real challenges. Um, hey, so coming back to the to the uh, whale, you know, one of the biggest questions I got from people and you maybe for you, too. You said it's a relatively fresh set specimen. We got less than a minute to go. Did it stink? Yes, it was uh, started to decompose. That's one of the reasons, you know, we just cannot put it on a truck and bring it. Uh, but it was in fresh enough condition to be able to get the tissues that we needed. Uh, yes, people should not be touching those animals. It's a public health issue. Uh, the animal died because of some reasons. And so uh, dead animals, like any animal, will have a problem. Well, Moby Solange, my longtime friend, we will not tell people how long we have worked together in the, in the community, but it's a long time. Uh, it's been a pleasure to visit with you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. And we'll have you back soon. Have a yeah. great uh, day, uh, and we will see you tomorrow.